am a internal medicine trainee at St. George's Hospital. Um, and as you may have come to my previous lectures in the past, um, this is single best answer questions in gastroenterology and hepatology. Um, so just to answer some questions about QuestMed and what we do, um, the so QuestMed is, a, we call it, an, we like to call ourselves a next generation QBank. And what we do is we combine some very challenging questions that are relevant to exams. And also lots of spaced repetition flashcards. And we try and make learning easier and more efficient. And the reason we started it is because we felt that our medical school didn't really provide us with enough practice questions. And loads of question banks that were there had lots of niche and random questions that weren't very relevant to exams. So our focus is really trying to make really good questions. And that's kind of perhaps what you have seen in the previous series that I just try and make questions that make you think a bit rather than just focus on rote learning. Um, so yeah, we focus on exams, being a doctor, and really throughout you'll see in this lecture as well that I try and focus on important skills that are probably more mental in a way, like diagnosis, differentials, investigations, and management. So that's what we're going to try and do throughout this lecture uh, for those who haven't seen any of my lectures before. Um, the other thing that we do is we try and de we've developed a system where we make if you do questions on our site, you can actually automatically add on flashcards to your daily feed. So it automatically populates in a very personalized way. And that's why we call ourselves a sort of next generation question bank, as it were. And um, so that sort of mix between questions and flashcards is why we sort of try and do something a bit different. Um, so previously, this, we've told people about the Smile 20 coupon, which gives 20% off any subscription. Um, so we currently have 4,000 SPA questions. So 1,000 is preclinical, 3,000 is clinical, 10,000 flashcards. Um, and as part of our COVID response, uh, 700 topics for notes are free. And at the moment, uh, 20 hours of SPA tutorials all are free. We're adding another 1,500 questions in about couple of months time for the next academic year we're working on a mobile app and then PSA mock tests we're developing as well and I guess after our just discussion now where maybe we'll look at doing some SJT stuff if there's enough interest so that'd be useful um, so we're doing lots of tutorials as well this week so we're doing an AFP tutorial um, so Wednesday and Thursday so you can just uh, if you scan this QR code you can access the Facebook group and you can get to that and then Dr. Timothy Wong is from Singapore one of my friends from uni is doing SBAs in infectious diseases and then really hard topic SBAs in medical statistics on Friday as well so if you're interested uh, join us and also uh, next week I'll be doing SBAs in elderly care and geriatrics which is sort of a more difficult, uh, look, not more difficult, but sort of an in-depth view on what you need to know for elderly care, which some people find uh, a bit challenging and maybe you don't get talked about it as much. Um, some people also asked about all our tutorials. So um, there is a tutorial on SBA exam technique. Um, so if you go to this link on our YouTube channel, um, you can find all the tutorials we've done. Um, one really popular one recently was how to publish as a medical student. And uh, three doctors, including myself, talked about publishing and you know how to get started publishing so i hope that's useful um and uh hopefully yeah you'll find it uh, useful when you're doing a revision later or after that uh so cool um so yeah single best answers in gastroenterology um, and also hepatology so i think with gastroenterology the most important stuff you need to know is related to um, first of all, hepatology and how the liver works, which we'll go through in a bit more detail. A lot of it is about investigations and which investigations are important to do first. Um, there are some emergency aspects like um, upper GI bleeds, for example, um, but also we will be talking about certain autoimmune disorders that do come up time and time again. Um, and for those of you who are from the UK, which I think there will be a lot of you, I'm sure, um, we do tend to focus a lot. Sometimes in gastro, we talk a lot about NICE guidelines, which are very UK heavy. So I think for this lecture, if you're not from the UK, I'll just tell you where sort of the NICE guidelines are, because sometimes the US stuff uh, is a bit different. Um, and so, yeah, I'll just make that clear throughout the lecture. So hopefully that's useful. So we'll try and do a whiz through most of gastroenterology and hepatology uh, to try and, uh, you know, make things work for, um, for those of you who are worried about gastro. I think some people were saying earlier in the chat. So hopefully that's useful. And uh, we'll start off with our first question. So I'll give you about a minute or so, and then we will uh, put up the poll and see how we go. Put up the poll now. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe put them up after 30 seconds so that yeah. people can read it perhaps. Read the question. Yeah. 
So, yes, and you let me know when you want the poll oh, yeah, to yeah. end. I'll give you another 10 more seconds, please, if that's all right. Good. We'll see what people think. Okay. So we'll see what people think. Good. So we have 53% have gone for A, CT abdomen, and then 27% have gone for D, ultrasound abdomen. Cool. So let's look at the answer here. Sorry, I've got loads of chats and stuff open, which is probably a bad idea. So, uh, okay. So, sorry. If I can take this out. So, uh, sorry, I'm going to just move this. My bad. Bear with me. Okay, cool. So we have a 76 year old man who presents with jaundice, intermittent abdominal pain and weight loss. He doesn't have any significant past medical history and he's jaundice, cachectic, so he's very thin. And he has a non-tender mass in the right upper quadrant. So first of all, this question is sort of referring to this idea that if you have jaundice um, and a mass in the right upper quadrant, that is indicative of a sign called Courvoisier sign, which essentially says that if you have jaundice and a mass, Unless it's proven otherwise, it's probably going to be a pancreatic or biliary malignancy. So, and, and the way that it works really is that you have probably something that is pushing, as you can see here on this red little um, circle, pushing on the bile duct somewhere, and therefore it is causing a... Um, it is causing the jaundice because the bilirubin is not going through properly. Well, we're going to talk about that in a bit more detail in a second. So therefore, uh, the jaundice and a mass is pancreatic or biliary malignancy until proven otherwise. So that's sort of step one of the question, which you sort of a lot of you may have sort of figured out to start off with. And um, looking at the other stuff, so alpha feta protein level is more useful for liver cancer. It's less likely to be liver cancer, I suppose, in this scenario because he has a you wouldn't really expect a tender mass, I suppose, in liver cancer because liver unless you would expect like hepatomegaly maybe or a very big craggy liver if it is a liver cancer in itself or it could be liver fibrosis so not necessarily that less likely and bilirubin level is useful and to see if someone is jaundiced um, but most of the time you just see that they're jaundiced so it's not the most useful investigation the established diagnosis mri abdomen not usually the case mri abdomen is more used for stuff like small bowel pathology and that's the best way to visualize that. Um, so the difference really is between ultrasound abdomen and CT abdomen. So ultrasound abdomen is good, but it's not the best investigation to look for pancreatic cancer. The reason for that is because you can get loads of like bowel gas and things like that that may, uh, may overlie the pancreas, so you can't see it very well. So in recent years, the, the best investigation to look at pancreatic cancer is going to be a CT abdomen to start off with. Have a look at it, and then later on you could do stuff like MRCP, ERCP, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail later. Uh, so uh, this sort of brings us on to talking about jaundice in a bit more detail. And and jaundice is something that people sometimes find it um, difficult because there's so many types. And as you can see from this quite kind of busy slide, you have quite a lot of causes of jaundice. So the way to think about it is to differentiate between prehepatic hepatic and post-hepatic. And there's two different types of uh, sort of uh, jaundice in the sense relating to bilirubin. And um, jaundice is really because of increased bilirubin in the body. And it can be unconjugated and it can be conjugated. And the difference between conjugated and unconjugated is that conjugated is water soluble. So it makes the urine dark and also less bilirubin reaches the gut and therefore you get pale stools. So when conjugated bilirubin in terms, and that is in hepatic and post-hepatic, you get this uh, symptom pathology of uh, pale stools and dark urine. Whereas in pre-hepatic, you have unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, which is not water soluble and can't enter the bloodstream. And therefore you don't get the sort of pale stool, dark urine. And on the most part in the prehepatic causes, a lot of it is things like hemolysis. So patients who have malaria, patients who have hemolytic anemia, um, you know, things like um, G6PD, sickle cell, stuff like that. Um, I did talk about this in a bit of detail in my hematology lecture. So you can have a look at that later if you like. But certainly a lot of the prehepatic causes are... Um, more likely to be um, some sort of hemo, sorry, uh, hematological and also drug related. So things like rifampicin, for example, can cause prehepatic, but also loads of drugs can cause cholestatic jaundice as well. So, um, which is, can be post-hepatic. 
Um, so I guess the idea is prehepatic is when you have breakdown of blood cells and bilirubin is very high, unconjugated. Hepatic um, results in conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, and that can be caused by a intrinsic liver pathology, which we'll go through in more detail later. And a post-hepatic is when you essentially have an obstruction somewhere. And that could be if you have a bile duct obstruction, like in pancreatic cancer. It can be an autoimmune disease relating to the bile tract, or it can be some drugs that can cause, I'm not exactly sure what the mechanism actually for drugs causing this cholestatic jaundice, but I think it has something to do with the flow of bilirubin. It just doesn't flow very well. Um, so that is sort of jaundice in a nutshell. So always remember prehepatic, hepatic, and posthepatic to help you to understand the differences between different types of different causes of jaundice. Cool. So uh, we'll move on to the next question. Give you guys 30 seconds to read the question. Right, we've got just over 60% of the people voted. Yeah, so yeah, I give it another maybe five, 10 seconds and then we will go through. Cool, so let's see what people think. Right, so 42% have gone for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And then what have we got? We've got 23% have gone for B hepatic cephalopathy, and then 18% uh, have gone for A. So uh, let's go through the answer. So the answer is actually hepatic encephalopathy. Um, so I kind of understand why people would go for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Uh, I guess the I mean, you've got something that's manipulated in the liver in itself, so you, you know, in the abdomen, so you may expect someone to have SPP as a result. But it's sort of not really in that area. So I'll explain that in a bit more detail. So basically, the idea is that you have someone with cirrhosis, alcoholic liver disease, lots of admissions with ascites requiring regular drainage. Yeah? Um, and the cause of ascites, as we'll talk about later, is that is you have loads of uh, pressure building up in the abdomen. And therefore, you need uh, the fluid kind of spills out. And therefore, you need regular draining. So sometimes what we do is we do this procedure called TIPS, which is a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. It's very long. But the idea basically, as you can see from this image I drew up like 10 minutes ago, uh, you have this, basically you have blood going through the portal vein, and then you have loads of congestion in the liver. Yeah. And uh, the, the problem, the reason that you have loads of buildup of pressure is because the liver is really fibrotic, for example. So blood isn't flowing through properly, and therefore you get buildup of blood. So the idea really is you're connecting a tube between the portal vein and the hepatic vein. And as a result, uh, you allow the portal pressure to reduce, and therefore you can reduce the amount of ascites, but also you can reduce the amount of varices, for example, which again, we'll, we'll talk about in more detail. Um, so one of the recognized risks of this TIPS procedure is actually hepatic encephalopathy. Um, as you can see from what I wrote down here, it's not really that well understood. I think the thought is that it's related to reduced elimination of ammonia, um, because that is one of the things that causes hepatic encephalopathy, which we'll talk about later. Um, and also possibly relating to the fact that you're not getting much uh, perfusion into the kidney uh, into the liver and therefore again you're not eliminating ammonia but again it's not very well established uh, the, the cause however it is a recognized complication um, so the other stuff really isn't uh, a risk factor or, or a risk after the tips um, but I understand why the uh, you would go for the SPP but you're not really doing anything in the abdomen per se you're mainly going in the vessels anyway so that's just uh, sort of an important aspect of how we would treat certain individuals we'll talk about that in more detail um, fine, so we'll do another question and then I'll talk about hepatology in a bit more detail um, and then yeah, see how we go. Uh, 
Okay, so maybe another 10 more seconds to see. Cool, so we've got 52% have gone for B, and then we have 21% C, 15% of E, and then 8% have gone for A. That's cool. So let's see what the answer is here. Cool, so the answer is B. So I think a lot of you got it right, it's very good. So basically you have someone with liver cirrhosis and they have a secondary to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is a recognized cause of liver cirrhosis. It's the sort of fatty liver presentation, which is a common cause of cirrhosis, um, all, certainly in the UK and Europe. Um, I'm not sure as much in the, the developing world, I think for possibly things like hepatitis uh, is more likely. Um, and uh, so they present with temperature and a distended and tender abdomen. And doctors suspect spontaneous bacterial peritonitis and you have an acidic tap. So the idea really is that anyone who is decompensated, who's a bit, you know, not as themselves with liver cirrhosis, probably a good shout to do an acidic tap. And the idea really is that you're trying to figure out if there's an infection. And there are many reasons why people with liver cirrhosis have an increased risk of infection. One of them is because generally they're immunosuppressed um, because uh, their liver isn't working properly um, and it's quite a complex immune process, but generally speaking, they're at high risk, yeah. Um, and the idea really is that you're looking for this sort of magic number, which is 250 uh, of the neutrophil count. So 250 neutrophil count is essentially diagnostic of SBP. And in this scenario, uh, the 40% of 650 is 260. So therefore, this is the right answer. So that's just one of those like exam pearls that you just remember putting in your head. Okay, 250 neutrophils, fine. This is SBP, if you see what I mean. So, and then in this case, you probably start someone on antibiotics and they may be a bit more long-term. And then hopefully uh, that should resolve the infection, but it can take a bit of time. Um, and they are at a higher risk of you know, worsening uh, sepsis as a result. So you have to monitor them, admit them to hospital, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. Um, oh yeah, yeah, there's one more question. And then we go through pathology. I just sort of put them all together just so that we can discuss and then other things will make sense as we go along. So I'll give you a... Uh... Okay, so 20 more seconds, guys. Cool, so see what people think, good. So we have 54% have gone for furosemide, and then we have 33% have gone for um, spinolactone, and then the rest sort of three, eight, and 2%, so that's fine, cool. So let's look at the answer here. So the answer is actually spinolactone. So you have someone with, again, NASH, um, what we would call it, apyrexial, pitting edema, Ascites, second to liver cirrhosis, and puts her on fluid restriction and starts on diuretic. So I, I know everyone uses furosemide a lot, and it's sort of the go-to thing for most uh, for most diuresis. You know, in for example, in you know heart failure, furosemide is certainly the go-to. Um, and I think the key here is that in someone with liver cirrhosis, the first line diuretic is always going to be spironolactone. And when I gave this lecture before, actually, I wasn't exactly sure why. Spire was better than furosemide. I don't think there's a very clear mechanism as to why it is, but I know that there are some big trials that have showed that it's better than furosemide in terms of diuresis. And, you know, spironolactone is related to so like an aldosterone, it, it antagonizes aldosterone, which is thought to have a very big role in uh, the accumulation of fluid in liver disease. And um, so therefore, one postulation is that it is, it helps to reduce it. And therefore, that's why it is a better diuretic. But certainly, it's first line, and it is 
better in trials and that's why we, we, we do it. Um, so yeah, just so you know, spinal lactone is the first line in terms of diuretics for uh, kidney disease, uh, for liver disease. So uh, cool, let's move on to a bit more of a discussion on hepatology as previously mentioned. So liver cirrhosis is when you have this fibrotic change in the liver from what you can see here and this sort of uh, damage the liver and usually it's a chronic process that is related to lots of changes that is sort of chronic damage and certainly the most common causes at the top right is alcohol, uh, hepatitis B and C, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Those are the most common causes in the um, uh, certainly in the UK, um, but there are some less common causes. Um, and patients present in a bit of a vague way, fatigue, anorexia, cachexia, nausea, dull pain. They can have signs, so like pulmonary edema, gynecomastia, possibly related to hormonal changes. And there's a difference, big difference between compensated and decompensated disease. And the decompensated disease is essentially when you get worse and your liver is unable to do the same sort of actions that it would normally do. So it, it sort of becomes quite bad quite quickly and people can become really unwell, especially on gastroenterology wards. So, and that's when, when they're decompensated, then they start developing all this crazy stuff that you have to deal with uh, a lot of the time as a junior doctor. So that could be ascites and that could be edema. So you've got to have to give them diuretics, jaundice as well. And puritis when they're itching a lot, bruising, um, where their clotting function goes off and they can bleed into everything really. Um, and then encephalopathy, where they have sort of very severe changes in, or can be mild, can be moderate, and can be very severe uh, in, um, mental status changes, which we'll talk about in a second. And um, I've just listed this stuff uh, on the right hand side because there's loads of causes. We'll talk about a few and then we'll talk about a bit of like um, the, let's say, um, the, the exam pearls, as it were, for uh, less common causes of liver cirrhosis. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, so when, you, when you're looking at liver function, you always need to do, sorry, look, liver cirrhosis, you always need to do investigations to determine the cause. So one, you also, you obviously do your stuff like the, the AST, the ALT, the ALP, those are quite useful. Gamma GT is quite a good way of seeing if someone's been drinking alcohol. Um, they tend to be raised in person, people who have been drinking recently. And protein is useful because you want to see if the liver is making enough protein. FBCs and use and knees. So an FBC is useful because people can bleed. They can have varices, which we'll talk about. Use and knees is useful because there is a connection between liver disease and renal disease, uh, hepatorenal syndrome, as you might know, and also coagulation tests. There are tests to determine the cause. Um, so I've mentioned here. Um, so there are some couple, a couple of like exam pearls again. Um, so alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is sort of a connective tissue disorder that can present with liver disease and also with COPD. Um, and uh, Wilson's disease disease uh, can present with a movement disorder and dementia alongside liver disease um, and it is related to copper buildup um, uh, as a result of a disruption in one of the copper transporters. Iron studies, hereditary hemochromatosis can present as this tan diabetes so people get diabetes and people get um, te uh, testicular atrophy and also there's an association with pseudogout as some of you might have noticed, I mentioned this in my previous rheumatology lecture. Um, there are some autoimmune antibodies. Again, I will talk about this in a bit. Um, and then there's a link to essentially anyone who has a bit of autoimmune flavor, so can have a higher risk of stuff like autoimmune hepatitis, PBC, PSC. Um, PBC is more likely middle-aged females. And then finally, there's a rare syndrome called Bud Chiari syndrome, which essentially is portal vein thrombosis, and that can be anyone associated with an increased thrombosis risk. That could be anything. So someone who's like postpartum on the oral contraceptive pill, et cetera, et cetera. Very rare, but just I just put it down for reference. But on the most part, there's a liver screen that you would do with lots of blood tests if you're not sure why someone's liver is going off or the liver function is going off. But in the general medical setting, to be honest with you, the most common cause is things like sepsis, antibiotics, drugs, those sort of things. Um, but of course, there are some rare causes, um, especially in patients who sort of um, who don't have any previous history of liver disease or alcohol, you know, you, you need to think about the common things rather than focus on the more obscure stuff. I just put this up for reference. There are lots of complications for liver cirrhosis. Um, it increases mortality and you have these compl complications which can be quite severe. So SBP, um, liver failure, which we'll talk about, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, which you need to screen for and do ultrasounds and make sure that they don't have it, especially in patients who have hepatitis. 
um, esophageal varices um, and renal failure. We'll talk about a bit more of that later. The child Pew score is a useful score because it can be a predictor of mortality and it can predict the need for a liver transplant. And it involves bilirubin, albumin, prothrombin, and encephalopathy and ascites. And essentially, if you have you know, very raised um, uh, blood markers or clinically they're encephalopathic or they have ascites, it's a higher risk of mortality. So it's a very important disease to know about um, as it can be associated with significant morbidity and mortality. Um, and there are lots of things you can do to treat it um, in certain instances, of course. So going to ascites in terms of uh, what, we, um, what we think about ascites is when you have this accumulation of fluid within the peritoneal cavity. And as I said earlier, the idea is that you have portal hypertension, you have lots of fluid that is stuck in the veins uh, as a kind of backlog, and it leads to fluid coming out. And one way of determining the cause of ascites is what we would call the serum ascites albumin gradient. So you essentially subtract the fluid albumin gradient, uh, sorry, concentration from the serum albumin concentration. And that essentially works in a similar way to, you know, in like plural taps when you have transudates and exudates. It's a good way of figuring out what the cause is. Um, but I'll show you that in the next slide. So, yeah, so really with the high uh, SAG, as it were, um, you essentially don't have much albumin in your fluids, and therefore that can be related to essentially like fluid shifts, so heart failure, hepatic failure, but Chiari syndrome as well, because you have loads of uh, portal vein uh, thrombosis and therefore portal hypertension. Um, with the low SAG, uh, essentially there's loads of albumin in the fluid and essentially loads of protein. And therefore, that can be related to cancers, tuberculosis, pancreatitis, nephrotic syndrome as well. And, and really, there's basically this idea that um, I, I think with nephrotic syndrome, the point is that you don't have much fluid, you don't have much album in the serum as well because of the kidneys. And that's why you get a low sag in it as well. But I guess the point is that it's the same idea as the transudate and exudate. You would have in plural taps. But here in this case, um, it's a good way of differentiating between them and another reason why you would do an acidic tap in someone with unexplained ascites. So with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, um, it can really present very atypically. So it, classically, you have tenderness and guarding, and, but really, in, practically speaking, people can just deteriorate suddenly with no other cause, who you know, have compensated liver disease, and suddenly it becomes decompensated. So that's one reason why you would do a tap, and you look for neutrophils, as you say, and then the people who with low acidic albumin are especially at risk. Um, I'm not really sure why they're especially at risk, but I suppose it may be related to the severity of their liver disease. And you, you can treat them with prophylactic antibiotics as a way of reducing the risk going forward. Um, and finally, I think finally, um, the management of cirrhosis, we would um, treat the underlying cause. We tell our patients who drink to stop drinking. You can give them, uh, they can be quite itchy, uh, these patients. You can give them cholestyramine, which is a bile acid sequestrant, sort of puts all the bile acids together, tries to reduce the bilirubin. Um, and nutrition, because those people just don't eat very much um, and uh, they can be quite thin. Monitoring for complications, as we said, decompensation, liver failure, ascites, um, SPP, HCC, uh, spinolactone as a diuretic, and paracentesis. And uh, the definitive really is going to be liver transplantation in certain patients. Not everyone can go on for a liver transplant, but some patients do. Um, and that's certainly a um, consideration. Who goes on to liver transplant? Um, there isn't really that much information about who definitely would go on to it. But the, um, I'll talk about some criteria later on. So with liver failure, the, you have this essentially this decompensated liver disease where your liver isn't working. So all the stuff that your liver normally does, like make proteins, uh, uh, get involved in coagulation factors and regulate your fluids, it just essentially goes bad. And therefore you have a, uh, it can, people can be quite sick. So I put this star up because hepatic encephalopathy, um, it can range from mild, where you just have a bit of sleeping disorder, or so where you can't sleep very well, and your sleep cycle is a bit poor, um, but it can move on to apraxia, where you can't really make 
coordinated movements. So classically, this five-point star, people with encephalopathy can't actually make a five-point star or draw it rather. Uh, and that's sort of a classic sort of way of looking at it. But obviously, if severe encephalopathy, you can get coma, you can, you know, have a very low GCS. So it can be quite serious. And you can give lactulose to help re reduce ammonia as it goes through the bowels. IV mannitol can be used to reduce cerebral edema. And coagulopathy, you can give them vitamin K, fresh frozen plasma, and depending on supportive management of whatever they have. So, you know, SPP, antibiotics, renal dysfunction, you can give them some hemofiltration, which can be useful. Um, and yeah, I guess uh, as we were talking earlier about liver transplantation, the, this is a criteria which a lot of you might recognize from your books, and it's something we use to think about um, who goes on to liver transplantation. Uh, as the case for us in South London, we are, uh, I work at St. George's, but I think our liver center probably is King's College. So if you have any problems, we actually call them. So you have to know this stuff before you call them if you're a medical SHO. So you need to look it up. There's no real, I mean, there's no real way, easy way of memorizing this. I think it should memorize it. You can use flashcards maybe um, if you want to memorize it. But if I was to distill them into some key points um, that are useful for uh, patients who come in with liver failure, um, I would say if anyone comes in with a paracetamol overdose, which we see a lot um, in, in the UK, we can always, always check clotting, LFTs, conscious level, creatinine, and doing a venous blood gas to check for pH. So that is the distillation of these guidelines in clinical practice. So yes, you can memorize this, which may be useful for exams, but in practice, this is the stuff that we look at to make sure that we check regularly in case people deteriorate in both paracetamol and non-paracetamol liver failure. Um, fine, so I'll leave that. I think it's just for reference that you should sort of maybe think about trying to memorize it and it's something that is a thing, basically. Cool. Right, so maybe, actually before we go ahead, should we maybe just look at some questions just in case, because we sort of finished this uh, side, um, just so we can stop. Um, so the five point star about liver failure, that's an encephalopathy. Um, it's essentially just a way of measuring if someone has apraxia, an ability to coordinate and understand movements. So that's the way. Um, IV dexamethasone is used for cerebral edema. It is used in cerebral edema associated with sort of tumors, for example, but not necessarily in encephalopathy. Um, Testicular atrophy and cirrhosis is probably related to the fact that it has been associated with testosterone. So if you have, don't have much testosterone, you probably will have testicular atrophy. Um, and spinolactone can cause gynecomastia. Um, I don't know what the mechanism actually, but it is a recognized cause. Um, and um, bumetanide is useful for clearing edema. Bumetamide and frusamide are almost the same thing. I don't know if bumetanide and uh, spinolactone have been compared to head-to-head -to -head trials. Um, uh, some people are asking, SPP manage paracentesis and IV antibiotics, do we need to add albumin? Yes, on the, mostly if you're draining some fluid, you would also add albumin as well to sort of replenish. Uh, so that's something. Cool. Um, and then, fine. And I will, I think I'll stop there and then we will, yeah. I think some, someone said, I don't really understand the physiology of hepatorenal syndrome. Is there any way to understand it easier? To be honest, it's quite complicated. I never really got around to understanding it in lots of detail. Um, I'm not sure it's very much required for medical students to know the physiology of it um, because it's quite complicated. But for your own interest, I'm sure there are lots of resources you can to read up on it. Cool. So we'll move on to the next question. Yeah. All right, you guys, so give me another 10 seconds to go through. <laughs> 
I'll have a look at the answer, see what people think. So 66% uh, have gone for C and then 19% uh, have gone for D. Okay, cool. So I think the answer is C, yeah, that's good. So this is sort of just a run through some guidelines, to be honest, which is a sort of part of gastroenterology as it relates to general practice as well. But it, it does come up quite a lot in exams and I just thought to put it in because, I mean, myself, I, I do, I think there is an excessive reliance on guidelines sometimes amongst medical students. And I understand that because sometimes you just want to have a very good um, method of, you know, having a rule of thumb. Um, so I think guidelines are important. In some instances, you also have to use your clinical sense rather than just focus on the guidelines. But certainly in this scenario, in, in gastroenterology in particular, there are certain national guidelines that we would follow. Uh, and also uh, we would, you know, we would make sure that they are followed up sooner rather than later. So someone who's 62 with worsening constipation and an iron deficiency anemia, really the only thing you can do is refer them for a two week wait for a colonoscopy. So, and, and, and that's the only way of thinking whether or not they have any bowel cancer, okay? Um, chest, abdomen, pelvis, not very good for luminal disease. So in the, in the colon or in the small bowel, um, Non-urgent, that's not appropriate because you need to do it urgently. Fecal occult blood testing is a screening um, test that we use for patients who are asymptomatic. And then we would not want to just treat their laxatives and review them in six weeks. Uh, that's not appropriate in someone who we might think has a colon cancer. Yeah. So NICE uh, is uh, the uh, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, I think, and they tell us stuff and this is what we do. And the, they tell us to urgently refer people two weeks if they are 60 years of over, if they have an iron deficiency anemia. Um, and equally, if someone who is under 50 years who has rectal bleeding um, and iron deficiency anemia, we would also refer them for an urgent um, colonoscopy. Um, or a ca cancer pathway, and then they can review them. So usually, sort of, they would consider doing a colonos uh, either a colonoscopy or a endoscopy, depending on if they have certain symptoms. But certainly, anyone with iron deficiency anemia who's over 60, you would refer them for a cancer pathway for consideration of either endoscopy, colonoscopy, or both. And that tends to be uh, at the discretion of the gastroenterologist who reviews them. Um, colorectal cancer, a similar sort of idea. Um, if they have someone who's over 40 with unexplained weight loss, abdominal pain, uh, 50 with unexplained rectal bleeding, and sort of as you go older, the, the guidelines change a bit, and you know, you have iron deficiency anemia, changes in bowel habits, and of course, anyone who has blood in their feces, um, occult blood as part of the fecal occult blood test. So, just a review of guidelines there, um, and then Esophageal cancer, um, so patients who have, um, you, 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 anyone who has dysphagia, 55 or over, uh, you refer them on weight loss, um, and any of the following, upper abdominal pain, reflux, and dyspepsia, you'd refer them within two weeks. So that's the sort of guidelines we would normally follow. Um, I just put them up for reference because I think people um, do focus on them and they, you will be probably asked a question or two about it in your exams. Um, so with the concept of esophageal cancer, um, on this left-hand side, you can see this metaplasia and these sort of columnar cells, which normally are squamous, and that is Barrett's esophagus, which is a risk factor for esophageal cancer. Uh, on this right-hand side, uh, does anyone know uh, what it is on this question? Uh, this image, uh, bird's beak, yeah. Yeah, so bird's beak, esophagus, this sort of achalasia. So basically you have an inability to relax and um, it's, an, it's a disorder that can be associated with dysphagia as well. And you can treat them with calcium channel blockers to try and relax the muscles, but sometimes you need to operate on them if it doesn't work. So that is just a bit of dysphagia and esophageal cancer, which is very important, but I'm not gonna talk about that because it's not technically gastroenterology, it's more surgical stuff. Cool, so let's move on to the next question. Okay, so yeah, so 30 seconds, so I'll give you a bit more time. <laughs> 
Okay, so let's see. Yeah, so another 10 more seconds, please. Cool, let's see what people think. Well, we might have to give it a bit more time. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no give you guys 30 seconds. Cool, so 77% of you have said D. Um, 11 and 10% have gone for B and C, that's cool. So the answer here is admit and start IV steroids, which is very good. So you have someone with ulcerative colitis. So there were known ulcerative colitis and they're normally on um, the uh, oral mesalazine, topical mesalazine to control her UC, feeling unwell, uh, soft abdomen, tender, no signs of peritonism, temperature is 38.5, suspect a flare up of a UC. So, the difference in terms of management of patients with ulcerative colitis um, and um, in terms of whether or not to admit them or not essentially is based on if they're systemically unwell. And basically, if you have a high temperature of 38.5, that would indicate that someone is systemically unwell and therefore you'd want to admit them and give them IV steroids. Um, the other options are not correct because you wouldn't discharge home because they're unwell, and also you would not start the manifliximab because you would want to try something first before you go to the heavy duty stuff, which is sort of monoclonal antibody, which uh, works, um, but you wouldn't start them off to start off with. So with that in mind, let's do another question, and then we'll talk in more detail about inflammatory bowel disease. So let's give you a minute to answer that. Cool. So, yeah, so 37, so give me another 15 seconds or so. Um, okay, so 44% uh, have gone for B, and then, uh, what is it, 25% have gone for E. Uh, fine, sorry, just answer a question there. Right, cool. Um, so the answer here is, um, is B, uh, is thyroprin. So I think the key here is that you have some with Crohn's disease, they've had previous um, flare-ups, they've had IV steroids that we wean down to oral steroids. Um, and I think that the key point I wanted to make here is that in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, you can have some differences in the management. And the differences are essentially that you don't really use mesalazine in Crohn's disease. You mainly use it in ulcerative colitis. I'm not sure there's a very good mechanistic explanation as to why that actually is, but certainly you would, um, you would give azathioprine in Crohn's disease and mesalazine is more used for ulcerative colitis. So, and then you may also use methotrexate later on, but not really in Crohn's disease. The fliximab can be used, but not to maintain remission. And the most part, you sort of use it if you have someone who has lots of flares. And metronidazole is used in Crohn's disease, but it's mainly used in sort of rectal disease. So you can give sort of um, either rectal metronidazole. It can be used in, or oral metronidazole as well um, in certain instances, but it wouldn't be used to maintain remission. So fine. So let's move on to talk about inflammatory bowel disease. So with Crohn's disease, it's an inflammatory bowel uh, disease, and it is related to transmural inflammation. Um, any part of the GI tract can be infection, therefore uh, can be affected. And because it's transmural, it affects the whole bit of the bowel, fistulas and stuff like that is more likely. Uh, GI symptoms can be quite vague, and you can also get lots of dermatological manifestations, which we discussed in our dermatology, uh, rheumatology lectures, 
ocular manifestations, anterior uveitis, episcleritis, and musculoskeletal stuff, arthritis and sacroiliitis. There are other hepatobiliary stuff that happens, so gallstones, that something that is more common in Crohn's than it is in ulcerative colitis. Um, and I'm not really sure, again, what the mechanism is, but it's certainly an association with Crohn's disease uh, rather than ulcerative colitis. And when you, when you investigate Crohn's, you want to do the basic stuff very well. So white cells, ESR, CRP, uh, you can get anemias if you're passing blood and thrombocytosis. But in someone who you don't know definitely has Crohn's, you would probably want to do a stool culture to exclude an infection in someone who has sort of new disease. Fecal calprotectin is now a very good way of figuring out if someone has inflammatory bowel disease. And if it's negative, you're quite sure that they don't have inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and it's essentially an antigen that's pr produced by neutrophils, and it's a good indication that there's an autoimmune disease going on. Um, endoscopy with imaging is required for the diagnosis. Again, we talked about MRI. We, it's good for small bowel disease. It visualizes it well. Uh, and in, you, in the past, people used to do like upper GI series with like barium swallows and stuff. And you can see the string sign of Cantor. And it, it is just, it's an old fashioned thing, but it does come up sometimes in textbooks and questions. Is that like you have this like string like appearance uh, where you have uh, this narrow terminal ileum suggested of Crohn's disease. Um, and really with a biopsy, you, you can get these skipped lesions where you have intermittent areas of inflammation. Um, what we call cobblestone mucosa, where you have areas of ulceration and edema, and also these rose thorn ulcers where you have inflammation, fistulary abscesses. Um, so, and, and the, the one last thing is this concept of having non-caseating granulomas. I think with histology, it freaks people out quite a lot because all you see is pink and purple and white. But the, I would always, with histology and exams, the, the things you should really look at, or what I look at is, is there lots of purple stuff, i.e. is there lots of lymphocytes? If there's lots of lymphocytes, it's pretty likely there's going to be an autoimmune thing. And the second thing I look at is, is there lots of cells clumped up together in a way that looks a bit weird? And if that's the case, that's more likely to be granuloma. Because really, the amount of things that they can ask you in an exam question relating to histology is very limited. So those are the two questions I always ask myself. And on the most part, it sort of works out. Uh, and to, and, and I'll, I'll show you some other evidence of histology going forward. But that's sort of my basic rule of thumb about how to look at histology in, in a nutshell. Hope that's useful. Um, with medical management of Crohn's, you're trying to induce remission. You can offer monotherapy with glucocorticoids, so prednisolone or hydrocortisone. And if you want to induce remission, um, or if you want to wean them off your steroids, you can give them azathioprine. So azathioprine is a good immunosuppressant. In certain individuals, they have low activity of an enzyme called TPMT. And if they have low activity of the enzyme and you give them azathioprine, it can lead to agranulocytosis, which I've illustrated in this picture on this right-hand side, i.e. there are no um, lymphocytes and blood cells. Uh, there are no sort of white blood cells. And um, so therefore, you should always check TPMT activity first before you give azathioprine. You can also try and give methotrexate going th forward. And then with Crohn's, you can give surgery if there are complications. And then with anal disease, you can give metronidazole or you can do drainage uh, operations for certain types of fistula. But again, you don't really know, need to know too much about it, but certainly surgical management of Crohn's is a very uh, wide subject. I'll leave that at this point as we're talking more about the medical management. Ulcerative colitis is, again, the other type of inflammatory bowel disease. It can be chronic, can be relapsing, remitting, granulomatous disease. Um, and typically in the third decade, uh, diarrhea with blood, urgency, systemic symptoms, and it technically only affects the colon, but you can get math ulcers. So, you know, the, if you do a, like a pan proctor colectomy um, and you take out the whole large bowel, technically it should be curative, whereas it's not the case for Crohn's disease, which can affect the, uh, you know, different types of different aspects of the uh, tract. Uh, so it's rarely curative in, in Crohn's disease in itself. Uh, with UC, you have uh, dermatological manifestations, again, ocular manifestations, musculoskeletal stuff, um, which we talked about uh, earlier. The only extra thing I would add is that with PSC, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, you, it is much more common in ulcerative colitis than it is in Crohn's disease. So you have patients who just have a whole lot. They have ulcerative colitis, they have primary sclerosis and cholangitis. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail later. And this association between autoimmune disease as well. 
Um, so you can get inflammation, um, you can get erythematous mucosa, you can get pseudopolyps, and pseudopolyps essentially indicate that you have sort of uh, damage of the wall, uh, of the bowel, but missing certain bits, so therefore it looks like a polyp, but it's not. Um, and the biopsy classically uh, reveal this loss of goblet cells, crypt abscesses, and inflammatory cells as well. Um, I think that probably I'll just remember the sort of these descriptions as these Crypt abscesses certainly are the things that people sort of pop up time and time again in exam questions. Oh yeah, okay, crypt abscesses, it's probably gonna be positive colitis. Um, but again, these are mainly like histological descriptions that probably won't have that much to do with when you're actually working in medicine, but it's just something as a pattern recognition in terms of how to recognize things in exam questions. Um, there are certain criteria that we use in terms of whether something is, or uh, ulcerative colitis is mild, moderate, and severe. And essentially, if you've got systemic upset in ulcerative colitis, you admit them. If you've got blood in the stools, pyrexia, high pulse rate, anemia, a high ESR, and loads of bowel movements, you would admit them to hospital, give them IV steroids, and monitor them. That's the sort of main idea behind this true love and wits criteria. Um, we manage depending on the how severe it is and essentially in mild and moderate disease we would either give a topical uh, ASA like mesalazine or an oral ASA which is sort of immunosalicylate and uh, so something like mesalazine is essentially similar to sulfazalazine and it's an immunosuppressant and you can give it topically if they have just proctitis or rectal disease or you can give them orally if they have more, if it's affected more of the bowel. And of course, if you have left-sided or extensive disease, you can give oral prednisolone as well. That's a sort of general feeling of how to deal with ulcerative colitis. Of course, the severe you see it changes because it's severe. So you would give IV corticosteroids and you would monitor them very closely. And if they don't get better, you can give other immunosuppressants, you can give cyclosporin, you can give infliximab, you can consider surgery. Um, and the indications for emergency surgery, um, there are a lot, but the ones that we sort of worry about the most are things like toxic megacolon, um, which I'll show you a picture about in a second. Um, and the, um, the other thing is that if their symptoms worsen despite being on steroids. So after about um, a few days, if things aren't really going very well and they're getting worse, then we would consider surgery uh, going forward. Um, so with this toxic megacolon, which is a very severe form of colitis, you get the bowel is very big, you get this thumbprinting with mucosal edema, and it is a high risk of perforation, so you need to act very, very quickly. Um, you can get a big hemorrhage as well, also colitis. And the last thing you need to be aware about in terms of complications is the fact that it's associated with colorectal cancer, and it's associated with disease duration, severity, and extent of colitis. Um, so uh, something that you need to monitor with regular uh, colonoscopies if you can to just see how they're doing and getting on. So that is also colitis in a nutshell. Cool. So let's just, uh, before we go on, let's just take a few questions just to see what people think. I'm not sure. Uh, are there more questions about this? Let's see. Lots of... Uh... You're able to see the Q&A. Oh, yeah, yeah. So how do you treat yeah. toxic megacolon? That's surgical management. Um, uh, fine, fine, fine. Would the PSC improve if a patient with UC has their colon surgical removed? I'm not sure, actually. I wouldn't think so. Um, you need to check for TM TPMT deficiency, yes, before you give azathioprine. Uh, and I think that's really it with regards to the questions about ulcerative colitis. Cool, that's fine. Um, sweet. Cool. So move well, on. Actually, key helping out answer some of the questions. Oh, yes. So Thank we're you very much. Yeah. I'm, I'm loving getting a medical view on this because I feel like I've got big gaps in my knowledge up until <laughs> the we've failed now can you take something out so i'm, I'm keep going this is great <laughs> oh excellent good good i'm glad brilliant so we will move on how exciting got some support there thank you um fine so cool let's move on to the next question 
Right, so where are we? Okay, let's give you a bit more time. So, cool. So, fifty nine percent have gone for um, A, which is total immunoglobulin A and IgA tissue transglutaminase, and then 19% have gone for D, which is uh, duodenal biopsy, and then B and C and E is 7, 8%. Cool. So the answer actually is duodenal biopsy. Wait. So I think this, I don't know whether or not one of the reasons that people maybe got this wrong is because people were expecting to see something like jejunal biopsy, which I get that's fair. Um, to be honest, uh, having spoken to gastroenterologists on the most part, the duodenal and jejunal biopsies doesn't really matter that much. You can do both. So that's sort of one thing that people kind of stress out about. So, oh, is it jejunal? Is it duodenal? The textbooks, I think, in the past or um, recently have, do also say jejunal, but actually it doesn't matter. Duodenal or jejunal biopsy both work. And that's a definitive investigation. And although T, uh, you know, IgA and TCG are useful and they're useful to make the diagnosis, um, the definitive investigation, while they still are taking gluten, if they have a celiac disease, uh, is... Um, going to be a duodenal biopsy. So in this scenario, you've got weight loss, you've got anemia, and they've got a HE raised red rash on the elbows. So that is sort of in indicative of dermatitis herpetiformis, which is sort of a classic association with celiac disease. So this 28 year old lady is much more likely to have celiac disease. And therefore, D is the correct answer. Whereas fetal calprotectin is more for IBD. Colonoscopy is not very useful in celiac disease because it tends to affect the sort of um, mainly sort of the small bowel uh, and then uh, yeah so that's the, that's the reason why D is the correct answer so with celiac disease uh, you get loads of lymph sites as you can see from this um, image the histology and you, you essentially get this loss of small bowel architecture which normally looks like nice and um, uh, nice and sort of like these villi as they come out, but they sort of get um, mixed in together and therefore um, they, there's lost surface area and therefore your absorption isn't very good. And this atrophy of the villi and malabsorption, it can lead to lots of complications going forward. The gold standard is duodenal or jejunal biopsy. And the management essentially is lifelong gluten-free diets. But the important thing is that you shouldn't tell them to stop gluten until after their biopsy. So, so that you can actually confirmed that they do have it. And there are many complications uh, as an autoimmune disease. Um, you can get hyposplenism, you can also get osteoporosis, and you can also get T-cell lymphoma, which is sort of a classic um, association. Uh, there's a mnemonic coming up, I think. Yes. So GLIAD, which I find it quite useful. GI malabsorption, lymphoma, and carcinoma, because it can, be effect can lead to lots of different um, cancers as well immune associations, anemia, and dermatological. So GLIAD is something I use quite a lot uh, for, uh, to remind myself about the associations with celiac disease. Cool, so let's move on to the next question. Right, so this is a sort of a quicker one. So I think we'll just give you another maybe 10 seconds if that's all right, and then we will uh, crack on. That's all right. So we'll see what people think. Cool, thanks very much. So 71% uh, of you have gone for A, which is cool. And the answer here is terlipressin. So you've got someone with alcoholic liver disease, hematemesis, high heart rate, low blood pressure. We think he has a variceal bead and given him fluids and blood and antibiotics, and he's stable, we're gonna do an OGD. And, and I guess this question is, you know, I think a lot of you know it, so I'm not, I won't spend too much time on it. Terlopressin is a medication that we give uh, in order to reduce the amount of bleeding in alcoholic liver disease, uh, var sorry, sorry, in varices secondary to liver disease. And the idea really is that terlopressin is what we call a splanchnic 
Splanchnik, I never know how to pronounce it, Splanchnik, Splanchnik, vasoconstrictor. The idea is it's trying to reduce the amount of blood flow into these varices and therefore you, uh, it reduces the amount of bleeding. And so I just put this octreotide as well. So you can come across this in US-based resources and they use octreotide in the US, interestingly. Um, but NICE in the UK says it's not cost effective, so it's not used, which I thought was very interesting. So it's a fun fact if you ever come across octreotide. Uh, octreotide is a somatostatin analog, I think, which tries to reduce um, the activity of the bowel, uh, of the gastrointestinal system, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, we don't use it. So uh, just so you know. Cool. Um, so yeah, upper GI bleeds, um, you get this hematemesis, and uh, vomiting of blood or coffee ground-like material, and or melina, therefore anyone with a suspected upper GI bleed, you would want to do a rectal examination to check for melina. And there are many causes, that can be varices if they have liver disease. The other cause is peptic ulcer disease, so people with H. pylori, people who have been having loads of um, NSAIDs like ibuprofen. So the classic is like an elderly lady with uh, rheumatoid arthritis who has lots of pain and comes in with a low HB. What's the most likely diagnosis? You know, peptic ulcer disease because she has loads of ibuprofen. Smoking does it as well, malignancy, and this concept of a Mallory Weiss tear where you have a person who is vomiting loads and they get a bit of a tear within uh, their gastrointestinal tract and that's causing bleeding. Um, but on the most part, it, in certain instances, um, it is, it's usually fine. They usually get better on their own. You just need to monitor them on the most part. But certainly there are some severe cases which I've not seen myself. Uh, upper GI bleed management. This is kind of the bread and butter of most medical students, sort of OSCEs as it were. Uh, so you give you fluid resuscitation, blood transfusion, platelets, fresh frozen plasma, um, nil by mouth, supplemental oxygen given if they need it, um, and the nil by mouth is the idea that they're going to have an endoscopy. Um, if they have a non variceal bleed, uh, i.e. a peptic ulcer, you can give them IV PPI after the endoscopy. In variceal bleeding, you would consider IV terlopressin and antibiotics as well. I think they use tazacin quite a lot in my hospital, but I'm sure there are others that people use. And then once they're stable, you would do an upper GI endoscopy, try and locate the source of bleeding, and you can try and give it adrenaline injection and also clipping um, and then if it is really really bad you can use this thing called a Sengston Blakemore tube which essentially is a big tube that tries to block off the varices and uh, that's something that can deal with really really severe bleeding but again I remember one of my consultants was telling me yeah, he's only ever done it once and it was pretty dramatic so I'm not sure you probably might not come across it in your clinical career such severe uh, upper GI bleeding. Um, so there are scores that we use, so some of you might have come across the Rockhill score, and it's a score that helps us to predict mortality. Some people asked me when I gave this lecture earlier, what's better, the Rockhill score or the Glasgow Blatchford score? There's loads of different scores you use. Um, I, as far as I read, it's uh, Rockhill score is better than for predicting mortality, whereas the Glasgow Blatchford score is actually better in terms of deciding about the timing of the procedure. So you can see here that you, you, you have stuff like age, blood pressure, comorbidities, and then for the Rockhill score, you also, it's, you have to add on extra stuff based on what happens in endoscopy. So if they've got sort of no blood or they see blood as well, or an upper GI benignancy. So that's something to take into consideration to, to be aware of how to use these scoring criteria when you are uh, reviewing patients with upper GI bleeds. Because when you're speaking to the endoscopist, you best get your Rockle score. Uh, you know it so that you can tell them what it is. And then I'm sure they calculate it anyways, if you don't tell them. But it's good to have it. It's good to show them you know what you're talking about. And then uh, just as we're talking about everything, there is, is everyone, what, what, what do people see here? Uh, do people see anything in particular? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's air under the diaphragm, pneumoperitoneum, oh my God, perforation, oh my God, call the surgical registrar, blah, blah, blah. It's very serious. You need to look into it further because there may be perforation, there may be surgery. And that's sort of that one of the reasons why we do an erect chest x-ray in anyone who has a, a concern about any sort of bleeding or abdominal pain or perforation and stuff like that. So yeah, we do erect chest rays, x-rays for many reasons. This is one of them. Cool. Um, fine. So we will move on to the next question. So I think there's maybe like four questions, three, four questions left. 
30 percent of you have answered okay so i'll give you another maybe 20 seconds or so so we can I think this is a slightly shorter question wow people have been asking loads of questions cool brilliant uh fine so 52 percent have gone for c good the answer is c good so you have someone who has lethargy puritis puritis sorry and scleral icterus and a palpable liver edge so there's a couple of ways of actually answering this one way is thinking 52 year old with jaundice and hepatomegaly 52 year old lady and no obvious history of alcohol or anything like that or travel or anything like that, the most likely is gonna be PBC because that um, primary biliary cholangitis, also called primary biliary cirrhosis. And that's because it just fits the sort of age range, sort of middle-aged woman with jaundice and hepatomegaly. That's the sort of age range. So that's one way of answering it. The other way is literally just looking at the blood test and seeing M2, AMA, anti-mitochondrial antibodies positive. That is literally pathognomonic in this context of primary biliary cholangitis and those are the two ways to answer the question um, I'm not going to go into stuff in too more detail now because we're going to talk about uh, this stuff in a second about the different types of autoimmune diseases in the liver so primary biliary cholangitis is an autoimmune condition it causes scarring and inflammation of the bile ducts and it's quite a in a good disease for exams because you all you need is really the antibodies so this positive anti mitochondrial antibodies is positive in 90 percent of individuals and you obviously have the abnormal liver function tests not very useful for the diagnosis but certainly abdominal ultrasounds normally things that you would do in any case and if you're not sure still you could do a liver biopsy and you'd find inflammation and scarring as you can see on this right hand side loads of purple dots i.e loads of loads of uh, autoimmune things going on so that's how i think about it as i said earlier uh, supportive management so urso deoxycholic acid that try that helps with itching cholestyramine as well uh, vitamin supplements uh, you can give for patients liver disease anyways but also liver transplantation and that's quite a common indication for liver transplantation uh, primary biliary cirrhosis and um, actually it can still recur uh, after pbc which is very interesting i, I didn't know that uh, uh, before giving this lecture is that yeah if you transplant the liver you can still get recurrence of the pbc uh, i'm not sure what the mechanism is though um, primary sclerosis and cholangitis is a, another um, recognized um, autoimmune disease, and you get these deranged LFTs, um, positive anti-smooth muscle and anti-nuclear antibodies. And again, it's one of those things where, um, again, it's sort of pathognomonic to a certain extent. So you have liver disease in any individual, and you find that they're positive for anti-smooth muscle and ANA antibodies, and also ANCA sometimes, that is indicative of PSC. And what you get is that you see these beaded biliary structures, which they're seen on uh, MRCP or ERCP. And really with the MRCP, it essentially is an MRI of the biliary tree. And you can have a look and you can see these beaded structures. And equally on ERCP, which is when it's like an endoscopy, you go down and you have a good visualization. You put a dye into the biliary tree and that will allow you to see loads of strictures and that's more associated with primary sclerosing cholangitis. Uh, one exam pearl is that uh, there's a risk of pancreatitis post ERCP, it's a very recognized complication, so that's one reason why you would want to do the less invasive stuff first. Normally you do the MRCP before you do the ERCP. Um, and there is an increased risk of hepatobiliary cancer um, and as we said earlier this association with ulcerative colitis but also there is a risk of uh, colorectal cancer in primary sclerosis cholangitis cool um, and finally autoimmune hepatitis i wouldn't worry about it too much this um this disease because it's sort of part and parcel with the autoimmune uh, kind of hepatitic pictures but certainly the main things i would tell you to focus on is that you have this um, IgG predominant hypergamma globulinemia, which essentially means that you get loads of IgG antibodies in circulation. And the, the most important is probably type 1, where you have anti-smooth muscle antibodies and also the anti-nuclear antibodies. So yeah, lots of antibodies. So if you go to, the, if you go to the, our website, uh, QuestMed, you can look at the notes and just search for 
uh, antibodies in gastrointestinal disease. Um, and then you'll, uh, you'll find a sort of a good sort of summary of all the gastrointestinal antibodies, but also if you want to look at the rheumatological ones as well, they're there. So antibodies in rheumatological disease. So again, these are one of the things that you just have to memorize. And therefore, I would say that uh, just use flashcards are the best way to sort of memorize this and it will come up in exams and you'll be able to sort of think about it. I'm not going to talk about type 2 and type 3 because they're very, very com uncommon, but just to sort of put this up for reference for people to look into it later. Um, I don't know, not this question. Fine. Uh, sorry, that was one question from the one of the surgical talks, so uh, I'll leave that to later. Um, yeah, so we're doing surgical talk sometime next week, so come, come to that, please. Uh, so I think, well, this is our last question, if I'm not mistaken. So we will uh, wrap up with this one. So I'll give you another minute, and then we'll see how we go. Okay, so yeah, fine. So 84% have gone for B, which is the correct answer. Very good. Um, and and I, think, I think a lot of you probably got the answer because it makes sense. You have a 21-year-old, long-standing history of abdominal pain, bloating, and intermittent diarrhea. And you can see from all the investigations that are essentially normal. Um, the reason I put this in be, is because, practically speaking, you have a lot of times where you have patients with very vague abdominal symptoms, and the way to sort of investigate them is to do a few blood tests, do a, do a stool sample, and if it's normal, then that's it, really. And I think, just with irritable bowel syndrome, I think it's sort of one of those things where you don't really want to investigate too much, because that can cause lots of um, complications going forward. So a lot of it is trying to investigate just the right amount and then therefore afterwards sort of um, uh, treat appropriately um, if you are not worried about them having other diagnoses. So the things that we would be worried about in this scenario would be if they had stuff like, you know, uh, painful, uh, sorry, painful anemia, for example, or if they had uh, blood in their stool. Those are the sort of things we worried about. In this scenario, we have sort of very vague symptoms, abdominal pain, bloating, and diarrhea. The other thing is that the age, if someone is older, we may not be so happy about just leaving it at that. We may want to investigate it a bit further, as we saw in our previous sort of nice um, uh, guidelines of referrals. So in this scenario, young lady, no red flag signs, normal enough, but not normal enough, normal blood tests and stool, we would consider that to be irritable bowel syndrome. And, you know, we, there are certain criteria that we use in order to look at bowel syndrome. Um, but generally speaking, um, just I put this for reference, but on the most part, we're just looking at um, red flags, PR bleeding, weight loss, fevers, no physical abnormalities. Um, and then you would also want to do this, as we said, fecal calprotectin, FBC, ESR, CRP, and celiac, celiac serology. Um, and then I've just put this at the bottom so that you guys can see. So NICE said, don't do this stuff. So don't do ultrasounds. Don't do sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy, TFTs. F, uh, you know, uh, don't do hydrogen breath tests or uh, fecal occult blood. The idea really is that irritable bowel syndrome is quite common. And if you don't have red flags, you can be quite easily, um, sorry, not quite easily, but sort of happy enough to treat it appropriately. And this is certainly a very common scenario in the general practice setting, which is sometimes quite far away from what you would do in a hospital. Um, but certainly you would want to um, investigate appropriately and not go too far in your investigations if you are happy that there are no red flags. So that's the main point I wanted to bring across in terms of irritable bowel syndrome. Cool, so I think that's us for now. Um, so again, um, Smile20 for 20% of any subscription. The QuestMed tutorials is where we do all our live lectures and also where we put up all um, our videos and also QuestMed tutorials on YouTube is where we put, we're gonna put up this video later on.